From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. As the old saying goes, I'm sorry to inform you, but you've won the election. Running the economically depressed city of Providence is no easy task, but Eastside Democrat Brett Smiley wants the job. We will grow our economy by focusing on our strengths. Higher ed and hospitals, design, arts and culture, a working waterfront. A self-described progressive, the 34-year-old is joining a packed ballot in the race for CEO of the capital city. Our guest on the first half of Newsmakers candidate for the mayor of Providence, Brett Smiley, then. Rhode Island's version of the Gray Lady is up for sale. Like most newspapers, it's been a tough decade for the Providence Journal. With shrinking circulation and declining ad sales, the Texas-based company that owns the paper is looking to cut its losses. This week on the second half of Newsmakers, a media roundtable explores the future of the storied institution on Fountain Street. With our guests, Rhode Island Public Radio political reporter Ian Donis and Providence Newspaper Guild President John Hill. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and the aforementioned Ian Donis from Rhode Island Public Radio. Good morning, everyone. Brett, welcome to the program. Good morning, thank you. Why do you want to be mayor of Providence? Providence is a great city. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. And there's no better place to make a difference on the city and the quality of life of my neighbors than in the mayor's job. My experience running a business, working for the last two mayors, uh, and being active in progressive causes throughout my career well positions me to be effective from the beginning. In your speech, in your announcement speech, uh, you said you still have to quote, know a guy to get things done in the city. Uh, you're a former city lobbyist, water supply board chairman, fundraiser for Angel Tavares, fundraiser for David Cicilline. Brett, aren't you the guy? <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, yes, and that's the problem. You know, it, it happens regularly that I get a call from a business owner. Uh, not two weeks ago, I got a call from someone who's trying to open a new church in an abandoned and foreclosed building and because they can't go through the regular process at City Hall to finalize the process. So they call me or they call other friends that they know know someone to get the process unstuck. And these aren't special deals. These aren't special favors. This is a, a reputable uh, business in Olneyville trying to expand or a church trying to open its doors on Douglas Avenue. And no one should have to know someone in order to get that done, anybody. Whether they know me or anyone else should be able to get that done so that they can grow or expand a business in the capital city. Brett, what letter grade would you give to Angel Taveros, who you are supporting as a candidate for governor and are for, for his performance as mayor? And are there any significant ways in which you would be significantly different as mayor if elected? I think he, he deserves at least to be. He's done a, a very good job in bringing the city back from the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, and I think that my biggest criticism and concern about Angel is that he's not running for re-election. I think we need a mayor who wants to be mayor. We need someone with a long-term commitment to the city. Uh, change comes slowly sometimes in municipal government. And we need someone who's totally committed to serving a full eight-year term, and that's my commitment. You've touted your management experience as a former chairman of the Providence Water Supply Board, but when you were chairing that board, it applied for rate increases of more than 20 and 30 percent for different rate pairs. The board uh, provides water for more than for 60 percent of the state. So how do you justify those? kind of rate increases? Sure. Well, so first of all, there were actually no rate increases for the last four years, and we were able to keep rates flat uh, because of good management. We went through a management restructuring that saved millions and enabled us to continue to provide water, uh, high quality, affordable water without an increase. The latest application for a rate increase was to properly fund and maintain our infrastructure. How many times in Rhode Island do we see us choosing to pay full boat to replace a bridge as opposed to properly maintain it. And uh, the latest application is so that we can properly maintain our infrastructure, which is hugely important and we're going to save money in the long run. Um, it's no secret that Providence, even the mayor, when he was on here talking about his run for governor, is, he says, improving, but it's certainly not recovered altogether. Do you think it's still possible Providence could be forced to file for bankruptcy in the coming years? I think the mayor has bought us some time, a window of opportunity for us to grow our economy, to meet the challenges. If, if we muddle along or accept status quo, I do think it's possible that five years 
from now, we could be back talking about bankruptcy. And But that's why I'm running, because I don't accept that. I think that we need to hit the ground running. I think we need a period of sustained execution. We need to do some big things to grow our economy to meet those obligations. He's bought us that window of time, but the, the budget is not fundamentally fixed. Uh, we are not out of the woods, but we have some breathing room to do some big things. We saw this week in Detroit, uh, they are in bankruptcy. Their pension uh, promises are now in doubt. Um, and we know that in Providence, the pension fund has about $283 million in assets and about still over $700 million shortfall, even with the deal the mayor struck. Do you think he got enough savings from that deal uh, since it's going to be hard for any new mayor to go back and ask for further concessions on the pensions? I think you're right in that we can't go back and ask for more concessions anytime soon. I think the solution has got to come from economic growth first to see what resources we can bring to the table to help fulfill the obligations that we've made to those who have worked on behalf of the city. Let's talk a little bit about the, the economic growth that you've proposed. I heard you say, I think, uh, use this analogy that Providence is to Boston as Brooklyn is to Manhattan, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, of course, Brooklyn is a borough that's actually part of the New York City, but beside that, give me an example of how you would piggyback off Boston's economy. So we have uh, a thriving design industry here. We've got a burgeoning medical device technology sector. We've got a, a new movement for medical food. We've got some really great opportunities. And you've got Cambridge that is hugely expensive. Uh, the space is all full. There's no commercial space available. There's no lab space available. We need to be the affo affordable alternative to Boston. We need to have a seat at the table in Boston in terms of regional planning, in terms of economic How development. How do you make Providence m more affordable? Than, than Boston. I mean, we have some and, of the highest tax rates in, in the country. Right. So, so in many cases, Providence already is more affordable. The tax, the commercial tax rate, indeed, is higher. You know, but what's most important for for businesses is the bottom line. And so, whereas our commercial tax rate might be higher, there's other things that are less expensive here, and the quality of life here far surpasses that in the Boston area. And so, for existing businesses, we need to continue to improve and and be mindful of that quality of life because that's what sets us apart. And to attract new businesses, I think we can craft packages, tax deals or otherwise, that can help make it work. And, uh, and it's the bottom line, it's the total package that matters in terms of competitiveness. Well, speaking in terms of tax deals, you told us during your announcement that you would be open to the use of tax credits for the now vacant Superman building. Uh, that project seems to be in limbo right now. What do you know that Angel Taveras doesn't know that would help to put that back to a productive use? And would you be willing to grant the more than $15 million in tax incentives sought by the developer? So I do think that at the end of the day, uh, tax credits are probably going to be a part of the solution for that building. Uh, but the uh, what I don't support is using tax credits to subsidize high-priced luxury apartments. Uh, the the finances, the numbers work on on luxury apartments on their own. What we should be, if we're going to consider a subsidy, we should be considering that subsidy for one that brings jobs downtown, that brings people working there during the day downtown. And so uh, to attract the right tenant, to help a commercial tenant or an institutional user, to help consume a, a, a large portion of that space is probably how it's going to have to work. So if Angel Taveras can't bring a new uh, use to the Superman building right now, how would you succeed in doing so? So I think the the as mayor, I would be looking across the country for the appropriate user. I would be thinking creatively about solutions and how to, how to put a package together, whether that be a, a tax freeze, rent freeze, any way to make that, that space available and attractive. And, and also looking at the other movements in the market, there's not a lot of users that are appropriate for the Superman building. There are other tenants that are looking at other space downtown that maybe we could convince them to go to the Superman building because the building that they're looking at has multiple uh, uh, potential users. You, um, you talked about the meds and Eds, uh, which has been a big focus for economic development pro in Providence, but they are facing serious cost pressure at this point. Lifespan, renowned hospitals, mm -hmm. parent has been losing money. Brown's new strategic plan is very cautious about spending money. Mm -hmm. How much can Providence actually bank on them, you know, these large nonprofit institutions that are under federal and private sector cost pressure at this point? So I think the, the nonprofit institutions, the hospitals, and the universities, and colleges, would all agree that they can only succeed if Providence succeeds. So we know that we're in this together. That said, and many times you have to negotiate for what a, a, the other opposing party can give. And cash is not always what they can give. I think that the hospitals are a perfect example of that, where they are losing money and ca cash payment is probably going to be pretty hard to extract. As mayor, I would be negotiating for goods and services, for ways for which them, they can participate in our economy and in our city to strengthen it that might not be a check. And goods and services, though, 
that is money for them, isn't it? So what do you mean? That yes and no. What would be so, a goods and service so that wouldn't example, cost them anything? Uh, the, traditionally, one of the, the toughest negotiations with the universities or colleges has been Providence College. And uh, I think that there's a real opportunity for Providence College to participate in the improvement of our school system in, the, in terms of mentorship, tutoring, after school programming. And so negotiating over X number of student hours, X number of, of individual com community service hours to help improve our school system. So uh, it, that's not actually a cost, uh, but rather, but a negotiation. Right now it's a volunteer. There's a, there's a variety of, of university students in, in, in Providence that help our school system, but that's all voluntary. Uh, Brett, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I want to move on to crime in Providence. You said that quality of life in, in Providence mm. is a selling point here. Uh, in your statements, um, you said that Providence, quote, hasn't felt very safe lately. Overall, though, data shows that, that crime is actually down in Providence. So what did you mean by that? Every neighborhood in this city experiences crime in a different way, and, and just yesterday we had a shooting, a fatal shooting of a 16-year-old, and so, you know, safety is a feeling, and you can't tell someone they don't feel safe, and, and for what I hear and, and for what I've experienced in my own neighborhood, it hasn't felt very safe lately. The, uh, there are shootings regularly, there's theft and, and, and break-ins and, and petty crime that it seems to be. Uh, on the uptick. We all have a story about a public safety uh, incident that touched our lives uh, for those of us who live in the city. And so it, it needs to be addressed. We, you know, we're currently, so we've seen a reduction of almost 20 percent of the number of uh, uniformed police officers. A and I believe that that's uh, burying itself out. I mean, the, the men and women of the province police department are doing an excellent job of trying to keep a lid on crime with 20 percent fewer officers. Uh, but at the same note, you know, the, the sa health and safety of our, of our neighborhoods and the quality of life here is directly related to You safety. would want to increase the ranks of the Providence Police Department? Uh, more police officers is not the only solution, but there's no substitute for another uh, police officer on the, walking a beat. What about uh, Public Safety Commissioner Stephen Perry and Police Colonel Hugh Clements? Would you keep them? You know, I haven't made, uh, I, I'm not going to make a commitment on any individual personality, uh, and so, uh, and that's citywide. It, they might hear that and say, boy, that's not a, a ringing endorsement to the work I've done. Do you think they're doing a good job? I do think they're doing a good job, uh, but I don't think it's prudent for anyone to uh, to make commitments on uh, one person over another on any job and any department. Brett, you tout your progressive credentials, so do you support the labor boycott of the Renaissance Hotel? Uh, I, that's a between a private employer and a, and, a, and a private union. I will say that if anyone needs the protection of a union, it's a... Uh, housekeeper in a hotel making seven dollars an hour and so uh, I hope that they can find a resolution that involves those workers being organized I hope that their standard of living can can be in, uh, improved is that a yes or no in terms of whether you support the boycott well I wouldn't stay there um, Brett you suppose you proposed a, a I hope I have started a surtax on guns and ammunition um, first of all that that Providence couldn't pass that itself right you'd have to lobby the General Assembly to pass such a that's thing that's right that, and, um, you know, people are going to wonder and say, well, you're running for a job where you can't actually do that. Is that just pandering to, to the progressive vote in, the, in this when it's something that you can't actually do? We saw this year the assembly doesn't seem to have much appetite for any major gun cha law changes at all. So I, I think the, the guns and ammunitions tax is an important piece of a comprehensive public safety plan. Uh, a public safety plan that involves more police officers, that involves investment in community organizations, and, and I see that investment coming from a guns and ammunitions tax, and an improving economy with uh, with additional economic opportunities uh, for everyone. And so I, I do think that it's an important piece of the puzzle, but I don't want it to be mistaken to be the only solution to a public safety challenge. That said, just like we expect the tobacco industry to pay for public health initiatives, I do think that the firearms industry and those who prop it up should be paying for anti-violence efforts. Uh, Guns legally purchased fall into the, the wrong hands. Because of a provision in Rhode Island law, you can uh, own a gun illegally, but you can buy ammunition legally. And, and I think that those who buy guns and ammunition in the state should be paying towards the, the cost of crime and violence in our state. All right, Brett Smiley, candidate for mayor of Providence. We appreciate you uh, coming on the program, and we hope that if we do a debate, you're going to be a part of that. I absolutely will. All right, to it. it's good to hear. When we come back, the Providence Journal is up for sale. We're going to do a media roundtable and bring in the president of the Providence Newspaper Guild, John Hill. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, Ted Nisi from WPRI.com and Ian Donis from Rhode Island Public Radio. Our guest on the second half of this media roundtable talking about the Providence Journal is the president of the Providence Newspaper Guild, John Hill, who's also a reporter, a longtime reporter at the Journal. Uh, I do want to mention that we did invite management on from the Providence Journal who uh, they are a news partner of Eyewitness News and they uh, declined to come on the show. John, um, so everyone at the Journal learned, the staff learned, that the Journal was up for sale when publisher Howard Sutton brought everyone into the auditorium and, and announced it. Were, were you there for that? Yeah, we uh, got uh, an email blast. Uh, I guess it would have been around 8 in the morning saying there's a very important meeting in the auditorium, 9 o'clock, be there. Uh, That's an e-wave, yeah. you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh boy, was it ever. A little inside joke. Uh, there had already been an announcement posted on the Below corporate website. Uh, we assumed because they wanted it out before the stock market opened. But at 9 o'clock, it was the most feasible time because that's when everybody really starts showing up. What did he say to everybody? He uh, said that he wanted, it, he wanted us to hear it from him and that Below, our corporate partner, uh, partner, our corporate owner in Dallas, had decided that they wanted to explore the possibility of selling the Providence Journal. They had already sold uh, their newspaper in Riverside, California right. uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, and he described the process where they have hired an investment bank from Arkansas, Little Rock, they have, but they have offices all over the southeast and the east, to put together a, a bidder book, which will explain how the journal makes its money, what, what, what it spends on, basically a, a, an insider look at if you wanted to buy it, this is what you're going to buy. Bitter with two Ds yes. as opposed to two Ds. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, and speaking of that, what was the mood when the announcement was made? It was not unexpected. Okay. Uh, when they sold the Riverside paper uh, a month or so ago, uh, one of our business guys, Paul Grimaldi, had at, got the CEO, Jim Maroney, and said, hey, you know, you're selling this one. What about Providence? And he said that if an offer was made, they would have a fiduciary obligation to consider it. Mm. And as soon as they said that, I think everybody in the room knew this day was coming. So it, it wasn't a particular shock. And a lot of people are surprisingly seeing this as, as a potentially positive development. I Why mean, is it surprising? Not su well, it wasn't surprising because he had said that we were up there. And but I, I was I was I thought you know even on a good day this is an anxious business mm -hmm. since two thousand and eight. And you would think this kind of thing would make people more nervous and go, oh my God, who's going to come in? But there is a, a sense from a lot of people that this is an opportunity to kind of do a reboot. As you say, on. John, obviously the challenges facing the newspaper industry aren't limited to Rodan. If you were put in charge of the journal, are there things that you would do differently to put on a stronger business and journalistic uh, path? I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know that I really know what you would do. I, I do think you need to, to, to lock into the internet more. But I think part of what is confronting all newspapers right now is that the technology has just changed so generationally. I, I don't think publishers who came up through the business in the 70s and the 80s are really able to make the adaptation. You haven't seen, one of, one of the lines I have is the problem with the newspaper business in America right now is it's a business without a business model. No one has figured this out. And it, we may be to the point where the current generation of publishers needs to sell off and we need to bring in new guys, which is why I think in Boston with John Henry buying the Globe, here's a guy uh, who has made you know, significant fortunes in two different kind of businesses. And if you look, like, look at what he did with the Red Sox, he, he won what, three World Series mm -hmm. by putting in a, a system that everybody else who was in the game at that time pretty much said wasn't going to work, he didn't understand what was going on, and now you know, they hadn't won in what, 85 years and now they've won three. So he may be one of these guys who can come in from the outside and see it differently and figure it out. Uh, you have just Be Jeff Bezos from Amazon down in D.C. These may be the guys. Bought the Washington Post. Exactly. These may be guys who understand the Internet economy and may be able to see how what newspapers make can be sold there. And all we need is for one of these guys to come up with a successful business model, because the rest of us can just, you know, shamelessly steal from that guy and, and, <laughs> and, and do the same thing. John, did Howard uh, Sutton, the publisher, did he give you, uh, the staff, any indication of, of whether, uh, whether there's already, is there a buyer in the wings, and how long he expects this process to take? Word has been that, that through the years, uh, when Rob, the previous chairman, Robert Deckard, would often get calls from chains or individuals saying, hey, if you ever sell the Providence Journal, give me a call and that there had been people over time had expressed interest. But up until now, Bilo had not been interested in selling. Uh, so they're, I think they'll be interested. I think the way they're doing it indicates they're confident there's interest. They're basically opening up the auction and they're saying, folks, come in and bid. And I don't think you do that unless you think 
there are people there who will bid against it and maybe even you know run the price. All right, I want to turn to the panel here because we have two guys who have reported on the Providence Journal extensively. And Ted, you know how attractive of a sale would would the journal be? In other words, give us a. Um, a thumbnail of the financial situation at the journal. Well, the X Factor is having John Hill. I think that's worth many millions, <laughs> of course. Um, but you know, uh, many more millions but, if I leave. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know, and, and John and I've talked about this many times. I mean, the journal, like all papers, has, as you said, Tim, a, a, a very big business challenge right now. We look, revenue was about 166 million dollars in 2005. It was down to 94 million dollars in 2012, oh. and uh, the, the lion's share of the drop has been in advertising, which again is is a problem all over the place print they say you're exchanging print dollars for digital dimes you know because as you go online you're just not only is it difficult to make the business work online but the advertising just isn't worth as much on the internet so there's that and then circulation has also fallen significantly from about 212,000 in print on Sundays in 06 to 104,000 on the last one in September so undoubtedly you, you would get a business with a declining uh, business case at the moment the thing is you also have, the, the journal is strong in Rhode Island in a way I think that's even different from the Boston Globe in Massachusetts where I'm from because you know, the Globe, my hometown of Attleboro, there were plenty of households that just took the Sun Chronicle, the local daily. Yeah. Well, the journal was the local daily for the vast majority of Rhode Island for so long. It is still the news. So I think there's a lot of brand equity in the journal. The question is, do you get a buyer who's very focused on uh, keeping the journal profitable? And does that just mean managing this decline in revenue over time and, and keeping a certain return investment? Or do you have someone who says, there's brand equity here, I'm a public spirited owner, and I want to, to get a good, I want to make sure this it remains the civic institution. So briefly, is. the experts that you're talking to, what, what are they saying the price tag it's worth is? So I've heard anywhere from in the $20 million, uh, $25 million range up to as much as $50 million. And remind everybody what AHB Lowe bought it for? $1.5 billion, but that was the Providence Journal company which had nine television stations too. So you had a, you had a significantly larger enterprise being bought then. But again, I think you know, I think it's very, very hard to evaluate a newspaper's future income stream right now for any newspaper, not yeah. just the journal. And that's going to be the question people will be looking at in that book that they're going to put together is, is what are we really looking at here and, and can, this be, can this be fixed? Ian, you've written a lot about the journal. What do you think A.H. Below's legacy is going to be? Well, the, uh, Below suffered from bad timing. It bought the journal in the mid to late 90s when newspapers still had very healthy profit merge margins. Like many other publishers, it ran into the emergence of the internet as the uh, dominant media paradigm for the time. And since then, the Below has not invested in the journal. As a matter of fact, it's more been the opposite, that there's been a steady bleeding of resources from the journal over that time. Bureaus have been closed. There have been serial rounds of buyouts and layoffs. The reporter intern program that once introduced a steady infusion of young reporters into the journal was eliminated in 1996. So Below has presided during a time of diminished resources. As John said, no one has a perfect answer whether any other publisher or owner might have done a better job. It's hard to say, but Below's held the reins at a time of uh, a very tough time. For was the that intern program eliminated in 96 or 2006? Excuse me, I misspoke. 2006. And Thank you. So I have a question to, to you, uh, John, about, uh, you know, we say you're the president of the guild, so people understand that's a union that, yeah. that represents the workers at the Providence Journal. Um, how flexible is the guilt when it comes to change. Uh, you often hear when there are those layoffs that Ian talked about that union rules mean you have to start with the less senior people and, and mm -hmm. kind of work your way up. Um, it, it, no matter what the merits of it are, yeah. how good or how yeah. hungry they are. Um, is that the case? Is that how it works? I don't think so. Um, you know, there are certain bedrock principles that a union is going to defend and seniority is going to be one of them. Uh, and as this process unfolds, at this point, we really have no formal or even informal role in it. What's, what's going to happen is going to happen. Uh, the only way we can inject ourselves into it is if somebody who is, is a player decides to say, hey, let's talk. And, and so one of the reasons why I'm here at, on a forum like this is I yeah. you can jump up and down on the corner and go, hey, hey call me, call me. <laughs> but, um, you know, we are interested in the paper thriving long term. I mean, publishers will come and go. We are still there. If someone wants to buy the Providence Journal, what they really want to buy are the services of the people who are members of the Providence Newspaper Guild. We are the people who sell the ads that generate the revenue that makes the whole thing possible. We are the people who take the story, take the pictures and the videos. We write, we write and edit the stories. Everything in that paper that makes you want to buy that paper, we do. And if someone wants to buy it, we're what they want. 
And if someone is interested in making that thing work, and, and you know, we want to work for somebody who wants to make money, because if, if the company doesn't make money, we aren't going to get raises. I mean, we have mortgages and rent to pay. We have families to feed. We want this place to succeed. And if someone wants to sit down with us and, and talk to us about how to do that, Man, we'll talk to anybody who's interested in talking. And John, to us. your contract I know right now is almost up at the guild yes. uh, to, to be renegotiated. Do you yes. expect to hold off on that until a new owner is in place? It's, it's kind of early. We we just started bargaining, um, and we kind of you know this has just happened this week, um, so this is like the beginning of the beginning, uh, and that's something we kind of need to chew on a little before. You, you know, know, we have thirty seconds left. I'll ask this one question. Anyone can field it. What does the journal look like in five years? Uh I think if the economy picks up, you could conceivably have more. You'll have more people on on the on the ground. I think you know what Ian was talking about. If you can get some more bodies in there, I think this paper is going to be positioned that when the economy comes back, it will take off. It is. It is. If you want to know about Rhode Island, there is nowhere else you can go. If you want to know about what's going on in this state, I don't care. You know what we were in 1996 or whatever. If you want to know what's going on in Rhode Island and you're not reading it, you don't know what's going on. You can and also turn on Channel 12, say. just for yeah. the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John Hill, Ian Donis, yeah. Ted Nisi, thank you very much for joining no us problem. on the program. If you missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.